Good morning. It is such an honor to be here today. Thank you so much for the privilege. Dr. Moeller, to you and Mary, my love, Gina's love, extreme, extreme gratitude for the life, for the ministry of Dr. Al Moeller. And for Southern Seminary, I'm not a graduate of here, but uh, if I ever go back, I, you know, it'd be great. I mean, I, I, uh, I just am so blessed to, uh, to be here. I have a lot of, of my former guys here. One of my former guys, Ed Upton, uh, was authorized with his doctorate yesterday, and he'll walk real soon. And we're thankful to God for that. We have some of our Cross Church School of Ministry students that are now here. Last night, I spoke to a large group of students who are connected to the Highview ministry along with others, and what a joy it was to mentor and to encourage them. So anytime I really get in a seminary environment, I, I really get energized. I mean, I, I, I always think about what it would be like to go back, and then I have a few memories, and I think, nah. But uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Lord for it, and thank God for all of you. And, and if I can ever minister to you, serve you, honor you, pray for you, please let me know. It would really be a great joy for me. Today, I want to speak to you on a subject that I am extremely passionate about. Dr. Moeller asked me to speak on the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that I really believe the Lord has given us a word that we need to hear today. Because I want to talk to you about completing the great commission completing the Great Commission in our generation. I want you to look with me to some of the wonderful passages of God's Word. So if you would get your Bible or scroll it up, whatever you have electronically, we're going to look at Matthew 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, John chapter 20 and Acts chapter 1. And when we finish at 4 o'clock, it will be a wonderful day in the Lord. But in honor of the Lord's word, would, I, would you stand with me today? And I'm going to be reading from the Holman Christian Standard uh, Version. Since y'all had Tom Rayner on Tuesday, I'm going to read from his Bible. Uh, no, I've really been a, a, a lover of the Holman Christian Standard Bible for many, many years. And if preached and read it through numerous times and, and thank God for it. But Matthew chapter 28, and today I read these verses with extreme gratitude. 43 years ago today, Adam Greenwood, Adam Greenway on 43 years ago today, I gave my life to Christ. I was a student boy in high school, just really entered high school. My pastor led me to Christ. I was in a little old church running 30 to 40 on Sunday in Texas. Mom and dad loved the Lord. And so today, I'm telling you, I believe what I'm about to read. Jesus changed my life, gave me a message, and I can't quit, and I will not quit. The Bible says in Matthew 28, the words of the Lord, chapter 28, verse 18, then Jesus came and near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Then in Mark chapter 16, we read these words in verse number 15 and 16. Then he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then we read in Luke chapter 24, the words of our Lord. In Luke chapter 24, verse 46, the scripture says, He also said to them, This is what is written. 
The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and look, I am sending you what my Father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Aren't you grateful for that today? John chapter 20. The words of our Lord again are recorded in verse number 21. Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me. I also send you. Those are remarkable words. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. Listen to the word of the Lord. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Father in heaven, we pray now in Jesus' name. Would you take God's word today? Would you empower God's word today through the preaching of your word? May the Holy Spirit let these words live through us today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Since the late 1800s, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, these words have been viewed as the great commission of Jesus Christ. Even Southern Seminary's second president, John A. Broadus, used the term, the capitalized phrase, great commission, four times in related verses in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Therefore, it was in the late 19th century, when the phrase, the Great Commission, was identified with Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. I have stated since January of this year that the greatest need of the United States is for a mighty spiritual awakening. We need the next great awakening. Now, why is that important? Because I firmly believe that as God would set down upon this country in a powerful way, that that would move us forward like never before to prioritize the Great Commission and finish the task of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And while Southern Baptists since 1845 settled together, that that's our path, and it's time that we try to accelerate the pace of finishing the task of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. You see, the need is great. The need is beyond our own imagination of even understanding. Yet we know what missiologists tell us, that over 7 billion people live in this world today, and at least 3.9 billion of them have little to no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Comprising that 7 billion people. Missiologists say that there are somewhere around 11,256 people groups in the world, of which 3,052 of those people groups are both unreached and unengaged. Oh, listen, we have a massive need today. And when we say unreached and unengaged, we're talking about there's no evidence that we can see from our perspective that there's any gospel activity nor anyone who has a strategy to plant churches to take the gospel to those parts of the world. And yet, while that is a massive need of, of taking the gospel to penetrate the lostness internationally, think about our own nation. We know that today that there's an estimated 316 million Americans that have lived today in the United States, and missiologists say that an estimated 238 million of them, 75% of them, three out of four of them, 
have never received Christ. Think about that the next time you go to Walmart. Think about that the next time you drive through your neighborhood. Think about that the next time you're on a ball field. Think about that the next time you drive on the interstates across your own region. And speaking of your own region, we know that in the greater Louisville, Kentucky area, there's just over 1.3 million people. And according to statistics in 2010, an approximate 25% of this 1.3 million were a part of evangelical congregations in this region. So ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, administration, listen carefully. You live in a city, you live in a region of the country that it, there is a massive need for the gospel to be taken through this region of the country. And people are lost without Jesus Christ regionally. They're lost without Christ nationally. They're lost without Christ internationally. And when we look at God's Word and we look at the power of the Great Commission, we need to ask ourselves three questions today. I mean, for example, question number one, what will I give my life and my ministry to? Every one of you, you need to solve that. You can give your life and ministry to a lot of things, but let me ask you, will you give it to the Great Commission? There's another question that every one of us ought to ask ourselves today. What is my part in God's plan of what? Reaching the world for Jesus Christ. What is God's part? I mean, listen to carefully today. God's going to reach the world. The Bible says in Revelation 5 and 7 that every people, language, tribe, and nation will be represented at the throne of God. It's going to be done. So I've got to ask myself, what is going to be my part? What is Southern Seminary's part? What is your church's part in reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And then a question that goes a little bit deeper it gets a little more probing is, what would it take for me personally and for our generation to become the vanguard, the innovators, the trailblazers, the pastor leaders to complete the Great Commission in our generation? You know, there's just something about me that I believe God wants all of us to be a Great Commission people. Would you agree? I mean, I really believe that God wants us to be a part of being the Great Commission generation right here today. And my role may be to equip you to become that generation to complete the Great Commission. But I declare to you today, as long as there is breath in me, and as long as the Lord has not come yet, and as long as I am not dead yet, I'm going to believe God is wanting to use me and you in this moment for us to be the generation to take the gospel to the world. Therefore, when you come to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, along with those supportive passages in the, in the Word of God that we read a moment ago, there are some undeniable, undeniable realities about the Great Commission that we cannot ignore. Uh, let me point out these for us today. First of all, the Great Commission is authorized on one end by the authority of Jesus Christ and on the other end by the presence of Jesus Christ. Think about it, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Let's focus there for a moment. When you look at it, it's authorized on one end by the authority of Jesus Christ and on the other end by the presence of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 18. He says, all authority has been given to me. That means absolute sovereign authority the Lord Jesus holds today. That means complete and universal authority lies in the hands of the Son of God. All influence and all privilege, Jesus says, has been given to him. Has been given to him where? on heaven and on earth. Remember, he is saying this post the resurrection of himself. Therefore, the resurrection validated who he was already, that he was King Jesus, King everywhere he goes. He has ultimate kingdom authority, and therefore he is giving us the kingdom authority to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Maybe you haven't thought about it in a while, but wherever Jesus is, he reigns. 
Wherever Jesus is, he is king. He is king, Jesus, today. And he says at the end of the passage, verse 20, I am with you always to the end of the age. He is with you, meaning what? All of your days, the good days, the bad days, the tribulation days, the joy days, the days when you don't want to share Christ, the day you do want to share Christ. He's with you through all the days of your life. Therefore, when you're a great commission Christian and you're operating in a great commission church, you can be assured, listen carefully, that you have been authorized by the authority of Jesus and the presence of Jesus to do exactly what you do every time you preach the gospel, every time you share the gospel, every time you go to places where the gospel has never been in what we would call fulfilling the Great Commission. You're there with authority. King Jesus has sent you to go. And the supernatural power of God is undeniable when you share it. Even Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Lord affirms what? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I go through a lot of things on Sunday morning before I ever enter the pulpit. I would love to have the time today, but I don't, to walk you through some of those final few moments before I go out and I proclaim God's word. But I can tell you one thing I do. I have the Great Commission on the wall of my office, and I, I, I walk and I pray my office all around my office. And part of that process is, Lord, as I go preach the word today, I preach with the authority of the Great Commission. You have given me authority to proclaim this word. You have given me your presence to claim this word. If you're a preacher, listen to me today. You claim the power and the authority of the Great Commission when you stand and you proclaim God's Word. It is an undeniable reality that you have been authorized with the authority of Jesus and with the presence of Jesus to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But it's also an undeniable reality that it's been anchored in the Word of God and centered on the mission of God. That's what the Great Commission is. It is the Word of God. It is anchored in the Word of God, the Great Commission is, and the, the Great Commission is also centered on the mission of God. When you look at verse 19 and 20 here, as a pastor and as a leader and as a future pastor and a future leader or a future missionary, I want to tell everyone today and remind everyone today that the Great Commission is the Word of God. It is not a good idea that somebody had. It's the Word of God. And by the way, they are the final words of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you think that the final words of Jesus Christ ought to receive your greatest attention with your life and with your ministry? Certainly. I mean, think about it. These are the words of his heart. This is his vision. This is his passion. And he tells us again and again and again and again and again what those words mean. These are words that cannot be ignored by you. They cannot be ignored by me. They cannot be ignored by the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. By no means do we need to let these words become known as the great omission, but let them resound as the great commission. I really believe that John Piper, when he talks about the mission of God brings extraordinary clarity for all of us because he talks about how all of us understand that, that God's perfect design in the world was for all of us to worship him, that his, the world would be filled with his worship. But when sin entered the world, judgment came. And now that Christ has been sent to redeem the world, the sin of the world, he said in his book, let the nations be glad, the supremacy of God in missions. He says what? He says missions exist because worship doesn't. In other words, we must go to the world and win the world, touch the world, reach the world through missions because worship doesn't exist now because of sin. But Jesus has given us the promise. He's given us the authority. He's given us the gospel 
to change lives and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Oh, listen carefully today. The Great Commission is anchored, anchored in the word of God. And it's centered on the mission of God of, of redeeming mankind. Uh, let's look at it deeper today. Look, look at verse, look at verse uh, uh, 19 today. Remember, remember, many of you know this. You've been taught this, but we need to be reminded this, that the real major imperative of the passage here is to make disciples. That's what the Great Commission is. The primary weight of the passion or the, of, the, of the text is where? It's right there, making disciples. Making disciples is not just calling people into faith in Christ, but making disciples is nurturing them in the faith. It is, it is teaching them how to walk in Jesus Christ. It is teaching them to take on his yoke in Christ. It is, it is teaching us his character and his life. And what does he say we need to do about that making disciples? We need to make disciples of all the nations. Pantata ethne, of all the people groups is what that means. It doesn't mean the territories that we would see on the, on the wall. It doesn't, of a map, it doesn't mean when we look at a globe, it's referring to countries. It's talking about people groups. And so therefore we know that God wants us to go to all 11,000 of those people groups in the world and make disciples in every one of those living people groups or ethnicities. Now how, how is this ever accomplished? I mean, how do we do this? I mean, that's a pretty big assignment. Would you, would you not uh, agree with me today? How do we do this? Well, Jesus gave us three participles here that, that in these verses that elaborate more on this central command of making disciples. He, he talks about the importance of what? Going as you go. That even adds more force to it because of all the people groups uh, that we need to go to to make disciples and baptizing them. That's, that's that whole element of, 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 of public declaration that we're a follower of Christ and we're baptized as a public declaration of our faith in the Lord and we're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, meaning we are in unity with the Godhead when we're baptized. And then that whole element of teaching, teaching is so important. In fact, Dr. Moeller started this whole semester off talking about the importance of the spiritual gift, the gift of teaching. And so it's teaching us how to go and grow, how to have the character of Christ in our lives, instructing us in the Word of God, instructing us in the character of God, instructing us in the mission of God. Think about it this way. Because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, I am going. Because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, I am baptizing. Because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, I am teaching. The Bible tells us, and the International Standard Version uh, captures the tense, uh, the verb tenses quite well. It says this, listen to it, therefore as you go, disciple all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I have commanded you. Therefore, the Word of God is what anchors the Great Commission, and the mission of God is the center of the Great Commission. This ought to compel all of us. I mean, could you tell me anything in your life that ought to compel you more than taking the gospel to the ends of the world? Can you tell me anything more exciting to be a part of than to take a vision of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth? World evangelization is not a choice that you make. World evangelization is your life. World evangelization is your calling. World evangelization should be your heartbeat, making disciples of all nations in the world. Therefore, the Great Commission should consume your life it should consume your ministry. It should consume your church. It should consume your future. Oh, listen, we need to understand the importance of the Great Commission. It is authorized on one end by the authority of Jesus and on the other end by the presence of Jesus. It's anchored in the Word of God. It's centered on the mission of God. But listen carefully. It is an undeniable reality that the Great Commission is to be advanced personally. 
strategically, collectively, cooperatively, progressively, innovatively, and urgently. You say, Ronnie, you really believe all that? Oh, yeah, I believe all that. Well, why do, why do we believe all that? Well, the Great Commission is given to all of the followers of Jesus Christ. It is our calling. It is our future. It is our mission. It's the last will and testament of our Lord. I mean, think about it. Let, I mean, we don't want to think about this, especially when I use the illustration, we don't think about it. But let's say Dr. Moeller were close to his death. And he was in his final hours. And he told, get the video crew over here. I want to talk to them before I die. And he gives to us a final will and testament for this seminary. Let me ask you, whether it be at his funeral, whether it be at the chapel, post his funeral. And that video is played. Would you give it recognition? Do you think you'd listen to it a little bit more? Well, I just want to notify all of you today. That's what the Great Commission is. It's the final will and testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. It needs to be taken more seriously than anything else we can do with our lives. That's why we must understand today that we must advance the Great Commission personally. We have to own it. Do you own it? Strategically, what do we learn in God's Word? Regionally, nationally, internationally. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Collectively, it's given to the church. <laughs> That's what the Great Commission is. It's given to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your church passionate about the Great Commission? It's given to be advanced cooperatively. Cooperatively. Hey, Ronnie Floyd can't get the Great Commission done on his own. That's a New Testament principle is this whole element of cooperation. That's one of the wonderful things about what it means to be a Southern Baptist is that we get to cooperate to take the gospel to the ends of the earth together. It doesn't matter if my church has 20 or my church has 20,000. I can be a part of a grand, wonderful plan to take the good news of Christ to the world. It needs to be advanced progressively. Progressively. Listen, Acts shows the progression of God's unstoppable kingdom of God. And let me just say this for a moment. God's unstoppable kingdom of God? The city of Houston, Texas can make any law it wants. But I'm telling you, the kingdom of God is unstoppable. And we need to understand no one can stop the kingdom of God. When you think about it, it is the progressive action. You look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and then you look at the rest of the book of Acts. Can I remind you? From Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. Judea, Samaria, chapter 8 and 9. To the ends of the earth, chapter 10 and following. Even the New Testament and even our lives, your lives today and your future today. It needs to be advanced innovatively. Listen, friend, we need to remember that we should become and must become the, the innovators, the trailblazers, the, the generation that completes the Great Commission. I mean, don't you want to be that in your life? Oh, listen, Paul was a great innovator. When you think about how God came on him and God spoke to him so profoundly, you remember what the Lord Jesus told him through the Holy Spirit in chapter 13 of Acts, verse, verse number 47? He said, Paul, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, the unbelievers of the world, to bring the salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul was preaching to a bunch of Jews. You listen to what he did. He went, he shook the dust off his feet, and with the rest of his life, he gave it to taking the gospel to the Gentiles, to the unbelievers. Listen to what he did. He went to places where the gospel had never been before. I want to challenge us today. Let's go to places that the gospel has never been before. You say, well, I, does that mean I have to go to Bangladesh? No, there are places all over Louisville, Kentucky, where the gospel has never been before. All over North America, where the gospel has never been before. Overseas, where the gospel has never been before. And we need to do it with urgency. 
urgently. You, you, I get often asked, what's the difference in the New Testament church and the church today? That is an easy answer to me. The New Testament church operated with an urgency and with an expectation of the Lord's return. The church sleeps and yawns much of the time in our culture today. We need to operate with urgency. David Platt says it well when he says, every believer this side of heaven owes the gospel to every lost person this side of hell. How true that is. I close with this story today. Did you hear the remarkable story last February of the neurosurgeon in the state of Alabama? It was published earlier this year on February the 1st, 2014. He was at one hospital in Birmingham and then was needed with an emergency brain surgeon, with an emergency brain surgery of another patient who was located in another hospital six miles away. This other patient had lost consciousness. 90% probability of death was in his man's life and in a horrible wintry weather that was very unique for the city of Birmingham. That neurosurgeon got in his car in a rare snowstorm and went towards that hospital six miles away. The only problem was traffic was locked down. There was nowhere to go. And after quite a while in his scrubs, he got out of the car in that snowstorm and he began to walk for six miles to go try to save that man's life. Authorities were alerted and they were told what? They were told to look out for a doctor. He's a neurosurgeon, and we need to get him over to another hospital to help save a man's life, including saving his own life. Well, they couldn't find him because of the weather. And after walking six miles with only his scrub zone, the doctor shows up at the hospital, assesses the situation, walks out briefly, talks to the family, goes in, performs the brain surgery, saves the man's life. It was such a story because of the uniqueness of this doctor getting out walking through for six hours in Birmingham, Alabama to save a man's life that he ended up being interviewed. And when the interview took place, the, the, the brain surgeon said that if the patient did not have the surgery, he would have died. And then he made a statement that was very powerful. And this is what he said, and I quote, and that's not going to happen on my watch. He would have died. And that's not going to happen on my watch. The vast majority of the world needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and how he's died to save them. We must complete the Great Commission in our generation. And it's time now for all of us to shift our lives, to shift our dreams, to shift our futures, to take the hope and the message of the gospel to places where the gospel has never been before, whether it be in Louisville, whether it be around America, or somewhere around the world, and we need to make a commitment together. Their spiritual death will not happen on our watch. Thank you for the privilege of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Thank you that you have called us to be a part of this exciting vision. You have empowered us by the Holy Spirit, Lord, and we give Jesus praise. Give us what we need individually, as a church, as a cooperative group of Southern Baptist churches, 
to get it done. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.